Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you back after this three weeks break and for the start of a new season, season seven of the Thoth Hermes podcast. My name is Rudolf. I am, as ever, your host. This is the first episode of that season seven. And today we are Sunday, August 22nd, 2021. Well, um, You're going to be surprised because we'll start with a new piece of music right away, right away music, Um, because today, and that's not new to season seven, it's just for today's episode for a particular reason. Today, I'm going to play four pieces of music for you. And so we'll start right away with the first. And um, well, it's called the cup because the others are called the disc, the sword and the wand which tells you it's all about the tarot. And that's why, of course, it has to be four pieces. It doesn't make sense if we only played three out of four, right? Okay, so let's start with the cup and I'll tell you more about that music just afterwards. Enjoy.
the cup a piece of a suit of four pieces of music uh, provided to us by one of our listeners um, the name of the music group is called Zencestry Zencestry and the genre is called Sacred Bass I'll tell you more about it before we play the second piece but first of all let me once again welcome you to this new season to this new episode here today where we will have a large interview with Pat Zalewski, one of the great specialists of the Golden Dawn, especially in the Hore Ra tradition. He is from Down Under, from Australia, and of course Hore Ra uh, was mostly active in New Zealand. So we'll hear a lot about that part of the world here today, and I'm very happy that Pat found the time to be with us. Um, well, for those of you who have just discovered the podcast, Thos Hermes podcast, welcome. It's great to have you here with us. And for all the others who return and who also return after that three week break that we took, uh, which was nice to have a little holiday, I must say. Um, so welcome back to all of you. It's great to have you back. The Thought Hermes podcast has, of course, its own website, and you should all go there and have a look. It's on ThoughtHermes.com, T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com, because not only you find all the six previous seasons, all the episodes there to listen to, but you also find the show notes for those seasons. And you can get more impressions about the people I speak to. You can get especially also links to their websites, to their books, etc., so it's really uh, plenty of information there. Right. Um, then the other thing I, of course, need to tell you, like every time I release a new episode, so every week again from today on for the remainder of this season seven, um, well, we need your support. You know what's coming now. Yes, please uh, do go on the Patreon page and select Thoth Hermes podcast there and help us with your donation. We really need that to support that podcast. We have to find a few more of you over the next few weeks because it's important. And I may also tell you that's not quite ready yet, but within a couple of weeks, I guess it will be that there will be new special treats for patrons. I will talk about them here on the podcast when they are ready, but get ready to keep an eye on that. So go on to Patreon and become a patron or go on the Thoth Harvey's website and push the Patreon button there. Or if you prefer a one-off donation, just push the donation button and it'll carry you through the procedure. Thank you all. And thanks especially to those who already our patrons there are one or two each time more and it's really great to have you as supporters here very much appreciated while you're on the website all of you why don't you give me a feedback uh, i need your feedback i need people who write back to me and tell me what they think about the podcast what we could do better who would be the guests that you would appreciate to hear so please go there on the website there is a contact page there is also the possibility to send me a voicemail which is very nice to hear voices from time to time of my audience and um, I have a particular question for you here today. Um, do let me know if you or some of you or who would be uh, interested if that podcast also went on video. I'm not sure if there are many of you out there who really would like to have that, but I would be interested to have your opinion on that. So do give me some feedback on that. You can also choose Twitter or um, Facebook, of course, to send me that feedback and also just a simple email to info at thoughthermes.com. Whichever means you choose, it'll be much appreciated. What I've also always been asking for, and I do it again here today, of course, is send me your music. Your music, meaning the music that you have written or performed, you, the listeners of this podcast. And today's music is by one of our listeners, Blake Erickson is his name. And as I said earlier, the group or the as a music producer, I must say he goes by the name of Zencestry, Z-E-N, Zencestry, like ancestry, but with Zen before that. And he has done those that suite of four pieces uh, about um, about the tarot, of course, um, about uh, about the four forms of the tarot, um, and uh, we will play all four of them here today. 
and we have already listened to the cup uh, so the next will be the disc and the sword and the wand will follow later on in this show a few little words about uh, blake uh, he is not only a music producer but he's also a fellow podcaster and and you could also listen to his podcast which is called the dmt experience podcast and he is the author of a book called the forbidden fruit and the tree of knowledge opening the third eye so lots of things that you could discover by going to him of course you find those details all on the on the page for this episode on on the show notes for this episode sacred bass he tells me is the name of the genre that he performs in and Let's go and dive in directly into the second part of that uh, of that beautiful music. And we are listening now to the disc.
the disc by Sensistry and you're gonna hear two more pieces in a few moments. Pat Zalewski, we are gonna meet him now and Pat he is really one of the specialists and of the authors that have written many many books about the Golden Dawn. It's been uh, become a bit more silent around him lately because he has not released so many books in the last few years but his books like The Secret in Order Rituals or uh, the magical tarot of the golden dawn just to give you two examples have really become classics among the golden dawn literature and of course also in particular because he is one of those who have talked a lot about the hore ra tradition in new zealand which of of course by his own experience he was able to and others were not so much able to so it's really a very very interesting guy and i was really happy to talk to him and i'm sure you're going to enjoy this upcoming interview as always we have an interview of a bit over an hour split in half with some music in the middle you guys who are often coming here to the thoughts Hermes podcast you already know that well the first time i personally got in touch with pat's writings was the already mentioned book the secret inner order rituals of the golden dawn um of course attracted by the title who would not be who is interested in the golden dawn and ceremonial magic in general and um as always i would like to read you a few lines from that book in that case because uh, it's my personal favorite i wouldn't even say there are the great books but it's something that interested me in particular and i'll read you a chapter a little part from the introductional chapter by pat now to give you an idea about that book and about him and uh, we'll get much more about him in a moment after that the he mentions in that little text i'm going to read also israel israel regardi who he met in person and he gives us also his experience about Israel Regardi during the interview. So you're going to enjoy that. Here we go. The idea to publish this book originally came through a frustration with Golden Dawn authors stating that all the Golden Dawn temples had closed their doors by the end of the 1950s and that Israel Regardi was the last living adept of the Golden Dawn. From that point, the concept of an imagined golden dawn began to form in some authors' minds as to what they taught and how they taught, solely based on papers without any context for knowing how those papers were delivered, what the teachings were and with a lack of understanding what the oral traditions were. Temples were springing up like mushrooms in cow paddock and those who wanted to explore above the five six were using Wade's modified rituals and some of Crowley's. The only way to help change this was to publish these higher Stella Matutina rituals and create a level playing field by providing everyone with the six five, seven four and etheric link rituals. Rigardi had published the rituals up to 5-6 and I wanted to round it off with this publication. At that point, I had not anticipated writing anything more other than to let people know what we had in New Zealand so the Aurora in history would be more than a footnote. Whatever my intention was, fate apparently had something else in mind for me. Before I was going to publish the rituals, I felt I had to ask permission from some of my ex warrior seniors and got their blessing to do so. The second edition would never have seen daylight if it was not for Tony Fuller, who had many of the same experiences I had with ex warrior members. He convinced me to correct a number of errors in the book, especially in the rituals, and also sharpen up some of the horror history and add more information in that area. So this was the introduction to the book, The Secret Inner Old Rituals. And we are now going to meet Pat Zalewski in person. As I already said, in about 33 minutes or so, we're going to take a little break and come back with some music. But for now, let's go meet Pat Zalewski in Australia and you all enjoy the interview. Here comes the interview. 
It is a great pleasure for me here at the Sauce Hermes podcast to start the new season, season seven, with somebody from, well, down under, I may say, here from my point of view in Austria. We're going to Australia today, to Brisbane, and meet somebody who has been a very important figure in the Western esoteric tradition over the last, well, decennies, we may say. And it's my pleasure to greet Pat Zalewski down there in Brisbane, Australia. Good afternoon for you. Good morning here for us. Hello, Rudy. Great to have you, Pat. Thank you for your time. Well, um, I just said your name is so much related to the Golden Dawn and also a very special Golden Dawn tradition, which we are going to talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, but when you go on the Internet and enter in Google, Pat Zalewski, numbers of books come up, but very little about the person Pat Zalewski himself. And I'm sure it would be really lovely today to hear a bit about your personal background before we get into the Golden Dawn and all that background. Um, so, Pat, when and where did your relation with the Western esoteric tradition, or I don't know how you prefer to call it, maybe the occult tradition, I don't know what's your preferred wording there. Where did it all start and what is your preferred wording? Well, I started, I was born in Brisbane in 1948 in Queensland, Australia, uh, I entered into the what you would call the occult tradition, oddly enough, through martial arts. That was my first starting. I was studying karate under Tamiyo Suji, who was a Japanese instructor we brought out to Brisbane in about 65, I think it was. And simultaneously, I was doing yoga to, to loosen up. And uh, the crossover points between karate when I did brief meditation and yoga was synonymous and uh, with each other and that started me on looking at the internal mechanisms which led me to Tai Chi um, I left Australia I think it was about 67 to to go overseas I, was, I went and left to Rabaul, New Guinea and I lived there and I studied Tai Chi under the Sido family and after I was there for for a while, I ended up in Hong Kong meeting uh, the seat of one of the CEDO's uh, grandfather, Dr. Liu, and we went to Macau, where he was based at that time. And we, at that time, there was a, a tournament, or there was some sort of tournament of sorts going on in Hong Kong, and they let some of the people, uh, the Chinese masters over from Hong Kong to come to Macau, but only because it was conditional and they had to be supporters of the government. Anyway, so I had an opportunity to talk to them and they gave me the basic uh, of about eight or nine of them and they were curious about karate and they introduced me to the uh, internal systems in more detail than what I had originally uh, had uh, worked out. And from that, they worked the internal mechanisms of the eight extra pathways and the uh, apart from the meridian systems and that took me to when I then left to study uh, um, yoga in India under Vivan Data. <clears throat> I went to, and I was, I was at an ashram there for about, uh, about six months studying Tantra. And uh, after I finished that, I went to Calcutta and we did a course in yogic breathing. Then I came back and uh, to Australia, then went to New Zealand in 1970. Uh, it was quite funny because um, when I came back to Australia, I always wanted to go to New Zealand. It was like a compulsion kept building up all the time. And I knew I had to go there and write a book, which is strange as it may seem. Uh, so when I got there, I thought I was going to be a novelist, but that wasn't the case. Eventually, I, I kept going with my martial arts. I represented uh, New Zealand at karate in the World Championships in 1975. I was on the New Zealand team. And uh, what I was doing then was also at the same time I was – uh, I got hold of Rigardi's book on the Golden Dawn, and uh, that for me was just like a hand in glove situation. That was, and so what happened was that uh, I, by chance, I, uh, I I met my my ex at that particular point. He came from the same area where the Golden Dawn Temple was. I didn't know this until I found out some information came later. And through her contact giving me a name, I worked my way through to a guy by the name of Percy Wilkinson. And Percy Wilkinson was a, a member of the Temple Fori Ra. And uh, 
I wrote to Percy, but Jack Taylor wrote back to me and he said he'd been expecting me. He said, they, and put in brackets, they told me you were coming. So I went up and, what well, we got there to a room full of people, which was sort of strange because I did, hadn't met this guy before. And so Chris and I walked in there and there was about number of five sixes, six five, I think there's another seven four there. And, <clears throat> and I thought, what's this? Anyway, Jack had a dream that I was coming up and uh, that's all there was to it. So he told everyone, he said, wave of the oaf. He said, I'm going to be teaching these people. If they want to know anything, that's it. The pimp was shut 18 months before, but Jack was still running the Order of the Table Round, which is an Arthurian mystical order, which had incredibly magical ceremonies in it. And uh, so what happened was I'd already had a temple going in Wellington at that time under Regardi's books. So what happened was that I was fine, being fine-tuned in ritual when I would go up north to Napier and he were, or Hastings, I should say, and he would then fine-tune me to... Uh, I had all the basics. I just need to fine tune the, the progressions and I know what the value system was, which is totally different to what Regardi did. There was a there was a massive value system differentiation between the two, and so I just kept at it. And he put me through the ranks, and um, I started writing. Uh, I wrote to Regardi first, um, uh, saying that Jack was still alive at that point. It's about eighty three. And I said, I had some document called the processes. I said, have you ever heard of them? I said, I had them, but I wasn't very familiar with them. Apparently, these were a set of 15 to 20 documents held by the Stella Meditina that actually came from Rudolf Steiner. And uh, so that's what I was told anyway. And so he said, no, but then I started a conversation with Regardi and he sent me a letter saying, I'm coming out to see you. And, <laughs> and he did. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so he came out in August of 83 and we he was there for a couple of weeks in Wellington, then he went back to uh, America, and I'd made my mind up after talking with Regardi, I knew what, pretty much what he knew. I asked him a whole pile of questions about the Bristol Temple, and he asked me questions about the, the members from Forey Ra. And uh, he spoke to Jack Taylor on the phone, they rang up, they had a good conversation. Uh, Regardi was very... Um, apprehensive about meeting anyone who was connected with the, from the old temple because they had told everybody in the 1930s that he was not a 5'6", he would broke his oath and did all sorts of weird and wonderful things, which wasn't the truth. He did break his oath by his own admission, but the point was that he was... Um, he was a 5'6". He was definitely integrated into the order. That's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. But they wanted to downplay that anyone a 5'6 could break the uh, theoretical confessional, if you want to yeah. use that term. And so as a result of that, I corresponded with Regardi and he encouraged me to write the first book, which was on the secret in order rituals of the Golden Dawn. <clears throat> and that was the um, <clears throat> that was the basis of uh, my writing. So I decided well, if I was going to write, I, I had to quit my job because I won't have time. So I quit my job at the in the government. I was a government employee, civil servant for about 14 years. And I decided to go down to the local market and do become a tarot reader, which was news to some people around me, believe me. So I got down there and I started <laughs> in the market. And uh, so as a result of that, I was able to, I'd work three days a week and I would have the um, ability to go home and write during the during the um, the weekdays, which gave me all day clear, the house had paid off at that stage, so I, I just had my normal normal run of the mill bills and expenses, and the money from the tower readings really was more than enough to satisfy. So I was doing a whole lot. I was doing up to about seventy readings, I think, a week, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then I was totally exhausted by the time, but I still kept writing. Um, so as a result of that. I started to, I used the gold, I used Wang's uh, Golden Dawn Tarot and I wanted to get, I'd done tarot reading before but I'd never done it from a certain perspective. So I wanted to know more about the cards. So <clears throat> I worked at it and worked at it. With all those readings we're done and I was there till the market till about 94 and I left to go up to Hastings which was where the old temple was. I was a member of the OTR, so I kept going month after month, and I was in there till about 99. Then, I'm, then when we uh, things didn't go well for me with my partner, I then broke up and came back to Australia, and where I'm li now living in Cairns, which is um, right at the top of um, east coast of Australia. And uh, I've since started to write and get more more on the internet on certain things and uh, push it. 
Over to you. Well, that, uh, thank you. Well, thank you for that very, <coughs> very condensed also way of telling your life story. May I ask a few, I go a bit in depth in a few points that, that struck me. <laughs> Shoot. A, when you started with your, with your, at first with the, with the, with karate, etc. did you have some background from your family? How would they see it? Did you, did you feel a vocation for that or was it just fun because it was a sport or how did that all start? Well, my mother, my mother was uh, a very, uh, her father was Irish, so she was a strict Catholic. Mm. And uh, from my dad's side, the Polish side, uh, he was, uh, they were Catholics as well. So I, I had a very strong Catholic upbringing, altar boy confirmation. So the idea of ritual magic to me was not, was not exactly a closed book when, if you want to bring it down to its basic ele uh, elements, because uh, I use the old Catholic mass. So I love the old uh, Latin mass, so, which I believe there's a big stash on, as we say in Australia at the moment, in the church. And uh, so when I um, when when I I was totally involved in in the energy pattern of the, of the mass itself, which, which which was good. And years later, that was in a I was in a, a straitjacket there to a certain extent. And years later, I was in a hotel. I can't remember where, and I ran into a to a young woman just for about, I spoke to her for about two minutes, and that had a profound effect on my life. And she said, uh, this is before I went overseas, and she said, get a, get hold of the book Life of Miller Reaper. It was by Winston Evans. And when I opened that book, it was like the Golden Dawn book. It showed me a whole new dynamic of what to see, what to see, and the old belief structure that I had which was narrow and confined, then shot open into a wider spectrum of analysis that I could utilise and comprehend. And then I started to look at the internal systems of the body, the chakras, the subtle anatomy, and that blew my brain out to a certain extent. And uh, <coughs> that was very helpful. And, and But the, the problem is that you know these things theoretically, but you've got to use it. And uh, it's all right trying to, you can concentrate on it, like I was doing in India, And uh, so as a result of that, I started doing what was called radionics. Uh, I'd written to uh, Tansley, David Tansley, he wrote a number of books on it. And uh, I, he was using chakra systems and subtle bodies, which were not totally unfamiliar for me. And when I'd gone to, um, when I'd gone up to, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, when I went up to, um, I think it was, yeah, up to Hastings and met Jack. They didn't talk about the Kabbalistic soul. They talked about, they talked about, Nisha, they didn't talk about Nishama and, and Kaya and things like that. They basically talked about subtle bodies, the astral body, the emotional body, and what they did and what the effect was. So that was familiar territory to me. A little bit different in India to what we, what they have in the West, but very, very similar. And as a result of that, I then sure. was able to work on those particular levels. So with radionics, you would douse out with a dowel, with a pendulum, what was what the problem was, and you could, they taught you to record the energy patterns of the chakras if there's a blockage in it, the same with subtle bodies, if there was a blockage in that, a myism, they used to call it. And as a result of that, they would then um, find yourself in a situation where you could look at the energy patterns and then explore them and use them. And when I was in India, they taught me how to project for magical purposes the same thing was in um, the same thing was in a, a ritual magic uh, exactly the same and because the when I combined that with the tarot readings on top of that again that opened up a, a faculty uh, in the uh, of, of sensory awareness that I, I previously had briefly but not just touched on now it just went full blown where I started to get impressions I could almost read the cards with face down and when people were starting to talk to me I got the impression it was, the normal tower readers can do this it's not a special for me personally but tower readers can do this over a time if they keep at it long enough and I kept at it really now being started in a I was still almost to this day, really. Um, but um, so that, that was that was how it worked. So everything just sort of locked into each other, opened the door. I met the people from Furry Row. I started, I, I wrote the, uh, uh, probably the ritual commentary book, which just looks at the analysis of the rituals and how they actually work. I did the tarot book with Chris, which is about 600 pages. It was mm -hmm. quite a large one. And um, we looked at other things. But there are other aspects as well, but these are just a touchy, these are ones I'm just basically touching on.
Sure. sure. No, I, I, I'd love to you to lead me to the other aspects in a moment. Um, what stri strikes me in <coughs> what you just said and about your life story, uh, your experiences in the first uh, decennies almost, I get the impression, were mostly Eastern, right? So you were in <laughs> India, you were in Hong Kong, you did uh, uh, all those martial arts uh, background and then the Indian background. And then you come back to your country and it fits all together with the Western tradition. Um, how did you, uh, I find that quite extraordinary. You rarely hear that. How did you experience that? I mean, you said a little bit of it now, but um, can you go a bit deeper into, into that? Uh, which part? Uh, well, coming back to Australia, <laughs> when I came back to Australia, I, I, I was an, I, I, my gold, main primary golden dawn work getting off the ground was in New Zealand. Then when I yes. came back to Australia, I was a, basically an unknown quantity and still am to a certain extent. And um, it was quite funny because when you're sitting in a, I used to have a little tarot booth where I was, people would come in, they'd do it. I used to love that. I like that because I could interact with people, you know. Mm -hmm. um, some of my people that I work with in the civil service with one look and couldn't believe it. But anyway, that was that I'm was sure. their issue. That wasn't <laughs> that was that wasn't mine. That wasn't mine. I love what I did. I love the interaction with people. I remember remember I've had some very peculiar interactions with uh, with tarot readers, but um, and other people. Uh, remember, I was doing it when I went to the market in Wellington. I, I met some well-known people. I met actor Kirk Douglas, who was over in uh, New Zealand, just for a thing. He walked in the door with a red-headed lady and a younger lady, and they were looking for cardigans or jumpers to put on themselves. And he started talking to me about when he did the tarot and they called it the Magi. And that was a very interesting conversation I had with him. I couldn't believe he was standing right in front of me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, there are some funny interactions I, I, I've had with people, some some good, some not so good, as, as you could appreciate. Sure. Um, one of the funniest ones that I was sitting down there once and this guy turned up, he was uh, had a talking stick and he had, looks like he'd been in the bush for about six months and came back and he said, you are a builder of the pyramids. You want a blessing? I said, I'll take all the blessings you can get. And I'm sitting down there and he raving on for about five minutes, giving me, giving me his blessings. Uh, and I said, I'll take them. Fine. Thank you very much. See you again. You know? <laughs> but pe people, people around me, that, that, that was the way it was. Um, there are a couple of unpleasant incidences, but there was also um, – I, I got physically attacked once uh, by, by a guy. Mm. It was the strangest one. Okay. Uh, I put him on his bum with an Aikido throw, believe it or not. Uh, it was, that was a long story. <laughs> but anyway, so apart from that, the um, coming back to Australia where I, in New Zealand I was interacting very much in the community over there of certain things. When I came back to Australia, I really wasn't because I was in a – in a city that I'd been to was in my youth up here in Cairns and um, I said where I wanted to be. My sister was actually moved up here, so I had family here. And as a result of that, I uh, this was a place for me to be. When I was in a when I was living in New Zealand, I kept thinking about coming back to Cairns for some strange reason. It just happened. Mm. So the compulsion was to go to New Zealand, the compulsion was to go to Golden Dawn, and the compulsion was to return home at a certain time. And I came back and uh, went to university for about seven years there. You seem to have had those those compulsions regularly in your life, right? Uh, I mean, yes, I have. I, 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 I have to admit, I have to admit, yes. Uh, yes. They're not yes. always right. I've made a couple of boo-boos, but when they're very, very strong and they just don't let up, that's when you know that you've got to go in a certain direction, and that's the way I've always played it. I can't say uh, my life has not always been easy, uh, but it's been uh, it's been interesting in some areas. Um, uh, most of the stuff I did when I did when I was younger, you know, when I was in um, when I was in uh, Thailand, I was living in uh, Bangkok. Uh, I was on my way to India, but I, I I'd lost my money in um, Thailand, and I had to get it back. And uh, I uh, got in with a bunch of guys, and I was working on the Mekong. Uh, for, for, for some of the Americans for about six months. And during that time, I was in the King's Hotel in Bangkok when um, Sean Flynn, Errol Flynn's son, walked in the door and he found out that I lived in New Guinea in Rabel. And he said, my dad came from Rabel. And I said, well, who was he? He said, Errol Flynn. <laughs> so I thought, wow. I thought that was, that was amazing. Well. So anyway, he got me he got me into strife, actually. He, um, he got me into a boxing match with a, a Thai boxer, an old guy, and I thought, and he said, I'll bet you $1.00 for every second that you can last in the ring with this guy. And I thought I could. I was 20 and 21 and stupid, or 20 and stupid at that time. But 
I lasted a minute and a half, so I got my money back. I was, <laughs> well, I was on my back. he was running around Bangkok for about for about for about a week afterwards, looking for ice cubes to get me out of the tub. I was in such a mess. I lasted, but I didn't do anything. All that it was kept on my feet, and that was it. I got I got creamed. Uh, he was yeah. So he was quite a quite a character um, in his own right. Um, so, but anyway, getting getting back to the esoteric side of things, I think I think what's happened. Uh, I see patterns in what I do. I guess everyone can, and I see patterns in the direction that I want to go. Uh, mm-hmm. I've never been lost for direction. I, maybe once or twice where I had to wait. I knew it would come, and it generally did. For direction I was supposed to go in, and it just worked mm-hmm. its way through. I had to um, when I when I left New Zealand just before I left. I was all packed up, ready to go, and one of those string periods come, in, come over me and said, you have to go to uh, back to Australia and you're going to meet the Angel of Light. And I thought, Angel of Light? I thought, this is cryptic. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I ran into my present partner, whose name is, she's Italian basically, and her name is Abbott Angelo, of all things, which is, <laughs> and she works in the, um, Just name. and she works in the field of, um, of helping people, you know. So, so that, that was, <clears throat> <laughs> that was another. That was another cryptic. I said it'd be great if you give me a name and address, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Abbott Angelo is quite a name to bear. Yeah, absolutely. He, yeah, Abbott of the Angelo, yeah, but and it just turned out to be. But Angel was included in the name, and the sure, Abbott, of course, sure. is, is another aspect of it. So, the, so there you go. So the, those are the those are the elements that uh, make up, I guess, me and uh, what I, where I am at the moment. And um, I'm retired. Um, I've just stopped doing tarot readings professionally at the shop very, uh, for about, um, about three weeks ago, but I've probably oh. done about, I've probably done about 20 or the 40,000 at least. Cause you know, you know, I, I, if you look over, a over a period of over 30 odd years, 30, 33, 34 year period, that's a lot of readings. Yeah, and so I use that knowledge on the foundation of the tarot for divin- divinity purposes to use and figure out what the tarot cards actually meant. And the images that we got through from, it wasn't just I was doing it, my ex was doing it as well. And so we had the, by using the tarot cards in that manner, that cramped manner, and to getting things done in a certain time frame for the next person to come along, you had to be accurate, otherwise they would not come sure. back. That was, the way, it was their basic reputation. But what happened was that things opened the door for me in, in, in a sense of being under, understand the cars, the golden horn system of the cars and how they worked, uh, the uh, and how they worked as, as a divinatory pattern. Uh, what happens is the tarot cards, this is probably what you're going to be asking, in a golden dawn ritual, the tarot cards, when you go through the pathways, they're tarot orientated, the trumps from the bottom up, from the, yeah. from the universe up. What happens is that the whole principle around you is you are doing a 3D interaction of the tarot cards. That's part of it. That's one layer of the system. So when you go through, you'll see diagrams, and the diagrams will relate back to the tarot card that you're working on. A good example is the universe card in the Golden Dawn, which is a, a, a woman with a scarf, and she has the zodiac around her, and they have a... a Seven stage star over over her face. Mm-hmm. Well, that's in the one ten ritual. You have the you have the zodiac circle, and then you have the next one is the seven stage star, the, uh, and uh, it's called the order of the heptagram. So what what's actually happening is that the tarot cards are related into the ritual, and the god forms that uh, in the rituals for the officers' positions take the part of the figures in the tarot cards. So that's all interacted, all inter- all inter related to a certain extent. So that's yeah, the principle sure. of how they work within the Golden Dawn. Other systems use a different method, but we're just speaking of one particular me- methodology. And uh, so that was an eye opener. And by using what we'd known in the tarot, we were able to open more doors from the readings. So the readings were one thing, opening doors and the rituals were, were another, especially about using, utilizing the tarot cards. Yes, definitely. Well, you were very right to point it out to me. I, I said Australia further back that you returned to Australia, but of course you went to New Zealand at that time. And um, <coughs> n- now that brings me to the question um, for us here in Europe, and I guess also partly in North America, it is very interesting to see that center that the Golden Dawn found itself in um, New Zealand at the time. Um, it, you experienced that firsthand on, I could say. And um, why do you think 
that happened down in New Zealand, what happened there that it became such a center at the time? And maybe as a further question, then um, what was the particularity of the Huarera system in as opposed to the English and later on the North American uh, practice of the Golden Dawn? Well, okay, very interesting because you've hit upon a few nails here. Uh, let's hammer them down. Take uh, the your first time. thing, uh, <laughs> okay, well, what's actually happening with the Furry Rose system was that Dr. Falcon, uh, through his, through his uh, Masonic associations, wanted a place, I think, Bursley to settle down. He was in his 50s, I think, by then, and or it could be a bit more. And he actually um, wanted to go somewhere. And New Zealand was like a, a new field for him, he was an explorer by nature. And New England was cramped. It was uh, in in the 1890s. It wasn't really a great place to live under circum circumstances. Very very cramped place. Not like some other some other countries. But anyway, um, when he went to New Zealand, he found he found himself in the rural area there. And the group was uh, they had a, a, a quasi religious group, and he was put in touch. With, uh, by someone who'd been there and said, look, go and talk to these people. They need spiritual guidance. So Falcon went over and he was like a like a saviour to them. He came in and he showed this whole group. They were putting on pageantry plays and things like that, but they needed a cohesion at that particular point that was never, never quite existed. It was there. It was there through a social construct, but not through a, a magical construct, apart from their own very strong church girls. When Falcon turned up on the doorstep, he, was a, he could be one minute here, as one of the chiefs of Bristol said, he could be one minute a pagan priest, and the next minute a, a man on the pulpit uh, talking about Christ. He was that sort of person. He could be all things to all people. <coughs> so he turned up and straight away, giving, he, gave, he gave them a value value system, I think, which was the order grades of the order. And so what happened was that small village of Havelock North uh, was placed between two towns in New Zealand, Napier and Hastings, about which are about 20 minutes drives away from each other. It was a smack dam in the middle and the whole area was rural. And that wasn't... Uh, wasn't a poverty area that some of these people had money, and so what happened was they all came together and uh, uh, they um, found that Falcon was really a leader that they actually wanted, and even the leader of the group that was there bowed down to Falcon. He was just almost untouchable. They built him a magnificent house in a rural area where there was no um, other other houses, and uh, they built a house beside it, and uh, they built the Furry Row Bolt and things like that to his specific vacations and uh, they loved it and uh, he had the mayor of the town of Havelock North as one of his people he had people in the contacts in the uh, uh, industry of uh, newspapers he had uh, people who were the son of MP so this was a very very well connected group very very well connected in all levels of society and if any if anyone started to push or get nosy, they would freeze them out and this was what he wanted this was the real thing these people weren't like in England, coming into a city area, he could come and go. They would, they would get together and they would work a situation where they would be there all the time. So he had, he had the chance. He was there from about 19. He was there in 1912. Went back, came back about 1916. He was there till about another 10 years. And as a result of that 10-year period, he put them together, licked them in, 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 into a condition, if you want to use those terms, and. What he did then was that they all got together and they all got interested and they all crammed into this vault. So the order, as they called it then, was a magnificent temple. Now, there were still people who didn't like each other. You had that anyway. That's human nature. But they anyway. pulled together as a Which cohesion. Which year are we talking about here? <laughs> well, we're looking – well, virtually uh, he came – uh, the temple, the temple he got, got, the temple started in 1912 where he put three people after three mm -hmm. months through the five, six – he came back in 1916, and from 1916, he really worked um, the order going. Now, but he had a side order called the Order of the Table Round. Now, in the Order of the Table yeah. Round, he had the, he had the Governor General of New Zealand, whose name I think was Jellico at that point. He had the head of the Armed Services Commission, and I think he had the Premier of the country. So this was so the, the connections. This wow. was a small small side order in New Zealand. So uh, so right. they all were interconnected with each other. The the Order of the Table Round was a separate group. It was a magical order as such. So they didn't get into the Golden Dawn. Stuff. 
uh, but they were still, uh, it's on an equal power of, of magical ability. Trust me on that one. Yeah. Uh, but not, yeah. not as much book learning. And so all those connections were there and they were very felt. Uh, the social constructs were the one that kept it going. The difference between England was that it was a, it was a rural area Everyone stayed in the one place. They didn't come and go. There were no idiots. They could control them. If people didn't like it, they were told to get out and don't come back. But everything was in a controlled environment. It was medically sealed to a certain extent. And later, after Falcon died in 1926, when Rigardi published his books, they said, uh, you're not to read Rigardi's books. No one would because you couldn't get them in New Zealand at that stage. You're in sure. Eng England and probably America. But uh, so... Um, they controlled everything. And because they controlled it, it worked. And when Mrs. Falcon died in, it was about 59, Miss Falcon took over. She lasted about another two years. And then John von Dadelson took over. He was the main chief. Uh, he was, I think it was a multimillionaire. He was a coroner, a inheritor of a newspaper. You know, I, I met him. And he was um, very nice, very pleasant. And but people who knew him from a magical perspective was that he was he was pushed through the grades very quickly because he married the daughter of the main fam founder of the group, and uh, he was nine two and she was eight three. They really had no idea of the magical ability. They were just figureheads to keep the thing together. And but the people who did the real magical ability were starting to die off a little bit. And when von Dadelson found himself in a situation he didn't know what to do, he wanted to rid himself of the order, he didn't really want it, was just placed in that position. And he sent out an order saying that they were going to have a meeting, which had never occurred. And the next minute the temple would say, We're closed. And they took the sale of the house, the temple, and they put it into a place in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand called Tohara. Now, Tohara was supposed to be a spot where there was no magical tradition. It was just a place where people could come and talk and discuss things, like a meeting house. Beautiful place, wonder, wonder, wonderfully to look at, but no magical tradition at all. And with the money from that, they put into Tohara. Now, Mrs. Falcon founded Tohara. That was the third element, the third triangle, the OTR, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Fariwa and Tohara. And... Uh, she was told, Mrs. Falcon, this was the rumour I got, uh, she was told probably about, I think it was about 1936, 37, late 1930s, this is about 10 years after the good doctor had died, that a, a master was going to come to New Zealand and yet to prepare the way. Now, not only she knew about this, but a, an Australian anthroposophical person knew about this as well. And they both met, they've communicated with each other and he came over and the idea of both of them was that this place that they built Tohara was for the person to come who was and then teach his ways or whatever this person was going to do. So far as I know he has not turned up yet but he was going to come from New Zealand so he had to come from outside so that, that must say new but they couldn't quite work out who, what or what he was going to do so so far oh, they're still waiting. <laughs> Let's now take a little break in this interview, as always, and listen to the third part of the music by our friend Blake Erickson by Sensistry as he goes as a music producer. Um, I hope in the meantime, after a few minutes, you got a bit used to those little accents, the Austrian and the Australian accents in exchange. <laughs> it was very funny. It's I don't know how it's about you, but it's always to us here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, pleasant to hear the accent of Australia and New Zealand and but you need a couple of minutes maybe sometimes to get into it <laughs> maybe that's just me uh, in any case um, well now back to music Census Tree is now performing for us again and it's now called the sword of course the third of the of that tetralogy I would call it about the tarot the sword by Census Tree
So today all is a little bit different because we have those four pieces of music here today. I am back here before we restart the interview to just tell you that we are going to continue with it now, of course. And it's great to have that talk with Pat, which I believe in the second part will even go more in depth into the questions that we are raising than in the first part. So should look forward to that, I hope. And uh, well, right away after we finished our interview, there will be the fourth and last piece by Blake Erickson and Sensistry, which is of course called, well, you got it, The Wand. And before that, let's go back to Australia's East Coast and talk to our friend Pat Zalewski. Does the... <laughs> I mean, this might be a stupid question, but I have heard it uh, asked several times here over in Europe, at least. Does the particularity of the New Zealandish local background, even native background, have played any influence in the Hori Ra group in the Golden Dawn down there? No. Um, yes and no. The background, the, the topography of New Zealand is extremely magical. It's like certain parts of mm. Europe and certain exactly. parts of... Very, very powerful. It's like some parts of Ireland where they see the fairy folk or whatever they want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. And that in itself was very, very strong. There was a strong element so you could draw from the earth. We, a house that we bought in Wellington and... Uh, in the 1981, was in the belly of a hill, which is like in Chinese uh, feng shui. Uh, it was an ideal spot. I could talk, stand in my house and just talk to someone almost 600 yards away and they'd hear me. It's like an acoustic thing. It was a bit tough when you're doing magical ritual, the old neighbourhood would hear you. On <laughs> but, uh, but apart from that, <laughs> it was a very magical place and we knew it. We knew it, mm -hmm. and when I went to when I went to meet Jack, I also knew knew the the ability of, of what I was doing and who I met. I knew this was important, and I made sure that I adjusted. So for some people, they stumble into these situations, and they meet the person, and they come back and think about it twenty years later. I didn't. I knew exactly what I had when I got there, so I was fully aware. And I think I put that down to my yoga training and my martial arts and things. So I knew what to ask. I'd already set the temple up as a preparation, so I just had to fine tune things. The only mention, the only mention of the uh, from New Zealand viewpoint that would be influential was in one of the tarot cards where she spoke about a Maori chief, an obscure Maori chief outside of New Zealand, Honi Heke, and she mentioned that. But that was about all. I never saw any other additional elements come into it. But New Zealand, as a topo top, uh, in its topography, was very magical. In my opinion, uh, other right. people would say the same. But yeah. so that that was so. There's an element of that coming into it as well. But, uh, here, are other countries, it doesn't always transpose. So you uh, and and you've got to look at what what do you call the energy of the order. Say we call the golden dawn. I I, I was very yeah. interested in Michael Talbot's book Holographic Universe, where he he used a hologram yeah. Yeah. as a perspective hologram to. Uh, so to get the energy pattern from it. So when the rituals would come down, when you uh, when you opened them up, they would come down as a hologram and as a complete unit. And yeah. you could draw from that hologram and you could use it in your own ability uh, uh, as a way. Uh, there are other projects. In, in Talbot's view, uh, a hologram can work the other way around. You can believe in it and then you can, asp you can have an aspiration wait, wait. for something and it will come through. Uh, if you want a, an example of that, probably not the best, but this is – one I'm on borderline on it in uh, Cairo, I think it was probably about 19 was it 1967 68. They had the apparitions of the Virgin Mary on, on, on a church, Coptic church, with about 5,000 people there. Now, if you have a look at the photographs of the image, it's semi-transparent. But if you have a look, there's a point where the doves flew past the people over the head. The doves have static okay. wings; they never moved. They didn't move. They were static. It's almost like a hol like a literal hologram as such. I really don't know about those things, but uh, mm. th that 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 struck me as, as interesting. Um, yeah. The so so the hologram from a esoteric viewpoint of the collective unconscious and also from the literal viewpoint has got a lot to, as, as it comes into it a little bit as well. 
Oh, definitely, definitely. You mentioned, and that uh, struck me because I have not heard that in the context of the Golden Dawn, and you mentioned it twice already. You mentioned Anthroposophy and Rudolf Steiner twice also when in your meeting with the Regardi and text that <coughs> had brought you. Do you see any influence uh, that has come over from the Steiner movement onto the Golden Dawn at some moment or time? Well, this is a difficult one to explain. Steiner was an incredibly brilliant individual. If you just go to his mm -hmm. website and have a look at his papers, he was prolific, enormously prolific in what he had to actually Definitely. do. Uh, I had a lot of, I, I admire Steiner's work, let's face it. I, you couldn't not to. Uh, whether it was right or not, I don't know. But anyway, getting back to the uh, influence, we believe the 6-5 ritual may have had something to do with Steiner and, and the Stella Meditina. Uh, the process documents, which very few people got to see, were just really extending your aura, you'd imagine a Hebrew letter on your chest and you'd extend it out and uh, outwards and you'd use that so you'd extend the aura outwards. Mm -hmm. The problem was that the aura and the subtle bodies are not the same thing. The uh, the subtle bodies are an interdimensional construct where the aura is a magnetized viewpoint that we see. So there's a difference in exactly. different, different and, dynamics. And that's, that's, very, that's very Steiner, right? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I would, right. I, I, yeah. I, that's a standard association with it. The, the whole, but the whole principle of Steiner's influence on the GD, the answer would I say would be almost non-existent apart from a few meditational lines that I would know. Um, the Steiner, the anthroposophical movement is a different story. What happened was there was about two, five, six members. I actually got a, there was a paper, I, I unloaded it from, it was a, I think it was either a PhD or a master's thesis. I, I can't remember where, exactly what. But I was doing some research and I found out that the, uh, There were two f women who were five, six in the very row order. They were interested in Steiner and they also at the same time, the members who were to start up the anthro anthroposophical movement, but they were not, they didn't coalesce. They were separate entities. The order was the order. Anthroposophy was the anthroposophical, I can't get that word out. It's <laughs> yeah. The anthroposophical movement, is, 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 it was a separate entity from itself, but, but it was a healing movement. And so they took the old philosophy of Rosicrucian philosophy, if you heal, you heal. And they go and do that. And uh, so, the, so the anthroposophical society stated up by Golden Dawn people from Forever, but it didn't last. It slowly, a couple may have gone to it, but it became an entity and within, within itself. Okay. So there was no real direct Steiner. Felker, Steiner set Falcon up, or Falcon set Steiner up. I could never work it out. Which he had to claim authority about ranks in the order. And Mathers wouldn't do it. Everyone at five, at, level, at the five, six level stopped basically. Uh, apart from his wife, she got six, five, but I think it was a THAM yeah. was the last one they did. And um, so what actually happened there was that uh, with Falcon had the opportunity of expanding his um, uh, base by telling people that he would give them higher ranks and higher ranks to people meant higher teachings. Of course, with Falcon, that didn't always materialize. What Falcon did, he took the THAM level and he made that the five six, which gave him a breathing spot. But some people didn't like what he did there and he cut all the subgrades out. He just had uh, Zelda Adeptus Mind, which is ZAM the beginning, then the next one was six five. There's no intermediate levels. He obtained some rituals that he used, but he didn't really, for the higher levels, he didn't really pursue it like Mathers did. He took a different thing, different viewpoint altogether. The information on paper really wasn't there. I knew it was more of a teacher guru respect. You would go to your Uh, the person who was instructing you and they would help you out and give you instructions on what to do. So it wasn't a laid down format. It was very subjective. And so the high levels within that, there were high level teachings laid out, but they weren't anything very, very detailed. There was a, an enormous allowance for that, which I didn't like. And uh, so when, when I started to write, I, I, I felt that the furry roll, though it worked with the social structure that they had, it would not work if you're trying to give this to people around you, if you give them a piece of paper and think, well, what's this? And I felt that the what they should do was um, have more information, which is pretty much what I've done. I, 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 I did a restructure of the grade levels. I um, 
restructured them up to uh, I get the five levels of the five six that are a six five seven four baby the abyss and eight three. I worked mm-hmm. on those levels and nine two, but that was separate entity in itself. So what what we did was we laid out very, very firm structured routes, uh, levels of what to look at, what to do, and we included alchemy in that because alchemy was never really used in the Golden Dawn format. Exactly. And I was, uh, my ex had written a small book on alchemy. She'd, she'd learnt, she'd done a, a, a basically a, a course under Alex Gathercole, who was from the Paracelsus organisation. He came to New Zealand for a couple of weeks and they did a very condensed course. But we knew where they were going from that. And uh, so I'd done some practical alchemical work, but it was really wasn't my forte. I, I was more interested in alchemical from a, um, from a spiritual viewpoint because then I could, alch- alchemy had a habit of bringing things together and unifying them under a single umbrella, which you could really get take and break down yourself. And so what we did was to do courses. I, I broke things down for varying alchemical texts like the Splendor Solace is just one example of that and other texts, Rosarium and, and, and the others and how they interrelated back to each other. And mm-hmm. uh, so the alchemy side of it was was looked at as a uh, spiritual alchemy, but I, it wasn't totally psychological. There's a, there's a crossover there for it, but... I didn't want to use that term because I, I didn't go into psychology. When I met Rigardi, he was very much into psychology and not necessarily magic, although he might he would say he didn't, but he he was into psychology was the essence. And for him, the Golden Dawn, uh, the uh, um, Enochian system was the pinnacle of it. For me, that didn't happen. The Enochian system to me was just one aspect of the system and psychology was a helpful tool, but it wasn't the main, main stem. And that was one of the fundamental differences, two fundamental differences between us. I was more interested in the subtle bodies, the chakras, the energy, the dynamics, and the build on it through archetypal representation and through the holographic period coming in together through auric manipulation and through healing to a certain extent, through mm-hmm. radionics. So I approached it from a totally different viewpoint to what Rigardi did. And uh, so I, I, I rebuilt the system to cater for the things that were left out and the system that we built will then go back into the old stuff and, and, and give you a, a, a more keener insight into it. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned Rigardi once again. I was going to ask you now, this is the moment. Um, of course, Rigardi, to people who are interested in the Golden Dawn, is one of the figures that you necessarily come across. Um, how was that meeting to you, apart from the differences that you just mentioned? Um, uh, how? What, I mean, he was uh, he's about 40 years older than you. And was that... Well, he was... How was, yeah, he was how did, how did, I think it was about 75 when I met him. I'm 73 and he was about hmm. 75. Five. Uh, mm. I was then, I think, uh, yeah, I was probably in my early th- mid mid thirties at that point. Yeah, mid going on towards mid thirties. When he when he, when he, he came eighty five, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, he came out in eighty four. Uh, and what happened was that uh, when I sent a letter to him, he wrote back and said, "Look, we're just normal people. Don't treat us differently." I thought, "What's he on about?" I said, "I said this guy's got tickets on himself." <laughs> So, <laughs> which is an aphorism, he thought a lot of himself. But I thought, okay, we'll just play it. So when I met him, uh, we met him uh, at the uh, James Cook Hotel in Wellington, and we went down there and we had a meeting. I'd organise it because he had emphysema. I'd organise it to, to have his uh, an oxygen tube for him and everything like that. It was all being delivered to the to the hotel, mm-hmm. and uh, he was a little bit apprehensive. But I was very, I'm being an Australian, I'm pretty blunt. Uh, mm-hmm. I call it exactly as I see it. And uh, when, when he came up and he was having a few whiskeys at our house, he, he said, well, he said, uh, they, didn't get, they didn't treat him well uh, at, at Bristol. And I said, well, they told me you never got a five, six at Bristol. That was the information that came down to us. And he jumped up, he said, oh, he said, they're bloody lies. I said, calm down, I believe you, I believe you. I said, calm down, drink your whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, <coughs> <laughs> when he realised he was among friends, he relaxed a little bit and uh, <coughs> told us some stories. And but he wanted to know what we knew. That was a big challenge. He wanted he would when he would meet people, he would challenge them to find out what they knew. And he said, okay. "Do you play in hockey and chess?" I said, "Yes." Yeah. So we got our own chess set. Uh, 
So he brought the chess set out and he looked at me and he said, oh, you didn't play it? I said, yeah. So we'd worked our own sort of rules out and everything, uh, we, additionally to what the Golden Dawn did. I'd actually sculpted yeah. the pieces in 3D. I, I'd actually sculpted them with a clay. Right. Chris, Chris painted them. And when, when we had the chess board, we never had anything on it except the, the – the, um, uh, just the, the coloured squares, which would show you the elementals in column and rank, exactly. you know, perpendicular and horizontal. Okay. I said, you're just like me. I didn't have those things on either. I said, yeah, we don't need them. I said, just play the game and you can see where the elements come through. And straight away, when we did the Enochian chess set, they actually, he, he got together with Chris and played a game of Enochian chess. That's the way he, of course, we, I think she beat him actually. And because of that, um, he, he understood that we weren't exactly novices at the game. And, and that really yeah. opened the door to him being a little bit more fluent with us and uh, okay. being straight with us uh, at the same time. So um, so really, uh, he was a unique individual. There's no question of that. Very prickly at times, uh, a very easygoing man, fit in with almost any company. But he, um, he had an ego as big as a whale. And every, all magic for him was psychology, even though he'd given a magical over uh, coat underneath it would be psychology because right. every time I approach something from a magical perspective he start up magic and I'd end up with a Jungian representation or something from okay. <laughs> or Reichen well, who knows is, but that's the way he would that, work there is, of, uh, there is of course that famous uh, saying which is I believe in his the seven uh, the 12 months book the year the year of the golden dawn or whatever it's exactly called uh, where he says in the very beginning and in other places that everybody who starts a magical pass should first have its his own psychoanalysis being done right <laughs> and he told this me is that. often being cited by people uh, what's your point on that Oh, this is rubbish. If you've got to go to a uh, – I'm probably an old-fashioned guy. I grew up in the 50s and the 60s. I took hard knocks. I did it all myself, basically. I didn't ask for help too much, but I really got it when I did. So I was very much do-it-yourself. But my approach in the Golden Dawn, if you want to go if you want to go through analysis and you think there's something wrong, don't do magic. Uh, yeah. If you want to find out something yeah. more about a person, try and get their magical – I said to I said to, I said to Regard, I said, you don't need to go through that. All you've got to do is you can do a tarot reading to find out if they're going to be any good or not. It'll take you about half a minute. Or if you uh, want to um, find out a bit more, just um, look at your astrological chart. You can tell by the – you can just look at the chart basically and look at the elemental distributions. Whether they, yeah. uh, You can see where the lack of and, and you can summarize the whole thing just from read, looking at the chart without doing it. An in-depth analysis, whether it be suited or not, whether you've got too much air, too much practicality, too a little, it, that's all there. If you can read an astrological chart well, it will tell you what you want to know. And if you really want to know more, you just do a quick tarot reading, which I can do probably in about 20 seconds. It'll tell you, should they, should this person yeah. join the order? The answer, yes, no, or they've got potential, yeah. but look after them. You know, that, that, that's, that would tell you. But his idea, yeah. his idea was he brought, tried to bring psychology into a full-blown construct into the order where I, I, I was not it's it's helpful helpful to use definitely it's a tool but uh, as a full blown uh, concept no uh, he wa he wanted to dismiss a lot of things and bring them down to a psychological perspective including including hierarchies and structures so he, he changed his mind he was a, I think he was a triple water sign or a double water sign which they often shoot themselves in the foot and sometimes they want something bad enough but they don't know what they want when they get it mm -hmm. Regardi struck me like that I liked the guy I liked him a lot I, I, I thought he was a very pleasant fellow very good mm -hmm. He, I, you know, when he came, we we're always promoting and demoting me, each other. He said, "Oh, you're two nine. I said, "No, you, you, you one ten. We were doing that all through dinner one night. And um, what happened was that when, when after he died, someone got a, uh, someone got a telegram that I sent to him. I had a, he'd sent me some information, a whole bookload of stuff, and I said, "Oh, you pre promoted the seven four. But it was a joke, and someone took it seriously. Oh, yeah, regard he gave me the seven four, but he never did. <laughs> <laughs> he never did. Yeah, so that okay. was just a joke between us, essentially. Uh, sure. So that never that never happened. I go after he died. Yeah, I gave yeah. an honorary uh, ritual with a lot of people. Didn't in the far I didn't like that. But I took the view, and probably Regardi would maybe deny it. But 
He was, I, I believe, very strongly in reincarnation and values, coming in and going out of life. I believe he had certain tasks that we have to do to come in and complete. And I think one of them Regardi had to do was to write the Golden Dawn book so it would survive. And I think he was right. He told me that point blank, and I believe him. And I think his job, even though it was unpleasant by some standards for doing what he did, he took a lot of, took a lot of hits, uh, that was his function. And I accept that for what it is. That's the way I looked at what regard he did. I didn't look at the man who broke the oath and revealed all to the public. I didn't give a I didn't give a hogwash about that. I couldn't give a darn. I was more interested yeah. in why that happened. And I'm convinced that it was to preserve the order teachings so they would come out at another stage. And that's exactly what happened. And some will say the same about me too. Uh, but when I did my I, I was well, I was going to say because when you take that book called the secret um, uh, the secret inner order rituals when you read that at first without knowing the content and knowing you etc you have exactly the same impression like if you took over the role of Rigardi a few decades later and opened up again how, how would you see that well a couple of things the difference was that first of all uh, I believe I knew straight away that the only way to preserve the order to get it going to a lot of different people was to get the higher rituals out there and give more information out on them. Uh, I had no and difficulty. Uh, well, what was in Regardi's book was very limited. They would give you stage directions, but they wouldn't give you the value system you needed for magic. Yeah. And that's very important. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's what we got from the people from uh, from, from Very Ra. Uh, when Jack put me through the oaths, he worded the oaths that I was up to the dictates of my own consciousness, so I didn't break any oaths. And I asked his permission before I published that book. I was writing it before he died. And uh, so it was cleared by him, and I asked a couple of other people for a while. They had no problem with it. As far as they were concerned, the order was shut, and that was it. The main allegiances yeah. had closed to a certain extent. And so, mm. but I wouldn't, if they'd have said no, I wouldn't have written it. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. so I, but I asked first. They said yes, and it didn't interfere with my oath. It wasn't the standard Golden Dawn oath. So let me do it. But I knew, but I like Regardi. I knew, I knew what was coming. And I knew that the way to do it was not to set up a whole lot of temples and try and do what a lot of people did. Each temple would then build and, but to communicate to the, in the masses, that was a way to do it. And that was my function was to write. And that's when the old thing for inference of almost, what, 18, 20 years before of me coming to New Zealand to write a book started to make sense to me. That was when, that was when I had to do it. So the, so to me, it was a, something I had to do and something I find compelled to do, which is more. You could say from a, a psychological viewpoint, it's, it's an ego, possibly, I really don't know. But our, but our ego passenger uh, is always one that is very helpful to in the creative aspect as well. So you've got to, you've got to look yeah. at different dynamics of it. But no, I, I firmly believe that um, I was put here to let the information out and also to give more ex explicit information on it, which they didn't really have in the old order. And I had to put this together. They didn't, the, the old people taught me a few things, but they didn't teach me everything. I had to learn certain things from the ground up. And that was part of it. Like I did the tarot from the ground up. I had to, I was, I worked as what, six years as a tarot reader doing 70 readings a week before I could get the, the tarot book going, before we understood the cards properly enough to give it a divinatory aspect. So, <laughs> so all of that, you know, so yeah. I, I did my homework first and I went through the, I went through it and uh, I found that the people who just got Regardi's books who didn't have the full picture or didn't have any additional information, they could go through the trimmings of the ritual, they could make it juice up. But in order for them to take that and extrapolate it on the same level, they would have problems and yeah. issues. Yeah. Yeah, but um, is it also maybe related to the fact that our time today and even the last 20, 30 years communicates in a completely different way than in the late 19th, early 20th century and even at the time that Regardi published his book and it needs more people who are, let's say, outgoing or with, with, with the content or is that, is that another matter? No, I agree with you 100% or 120%. Uh, <clears throat> that's exactly what's happened. The, the, work, the, the social structure of today is very different to what it was so yeah. many years ago. It's almost changing decade by decade. You've got different groups. Uh, you know, your social 
there was a very Christianized group at those days and some mm. parts of Europe are like that, but no more, sadly. Uh, and uh, so you really have a situation that um, you must go with what you've got and, and get, a, get the message through to as many people as what you've got. And that was the way I was actually writing. I, I never... We have people all the time pick up the books and saying, oh, an old man taught me, I'm a 7.4 or something or an 8.3. I really don't care, you know. Uh, people can claim whatever they want to claim. It's not about ranks. It's about having the ability to go through the stuff, put it together and then do it. If you go, mm. And then people come in claiming all sorts of ranks. Well, that's up to them. They can do whatever they wish. If people stick right. around stick around them long enough and they can't realise that they're being taken in, well, that's their problem. So... I don't like using the idea of fakes, but you don't get the full system that way. You don't get the benefits of knowing what went before you. A rank implies through tradition, through using uh, traditions. The whole whole aspect of tradition comes with you. That means the social structure, the value system, the help, the direction of teaching, all of that comes together as a unit. Now, if you just come in and say, I'm equal to a 7-4, I can pick up a book and do whatever I want. You're not going to get the entire benefit. So the Golden Dawn of different sure. temples and different groups has a high and low pitch. They don't, not all the same. Uh, you know, it's, I would teach people too that didn't want to, that Vusi found out it was too hard for them and left. So it's just one of those things that you have to get the right people to teach, the right people to help. And you've got to talk to them. You can't just do it on paper. You've got to be there for them. You've got to help them. You've got to show them what to do. And the, what we get today on the internet, we can do that where we couldn't do it before. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, the, but also I think um, you cannot give away those secrets on paper anyway, because if you don't lift the things, if you don't practice them, you don't will. You won't get what it means. Anyway, or am I wrong on that? No, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. You won't get what it means. You could see yeah. it, you could write it, and you could be a one-liner and you could put it to one side and say, well, that's interesting. There and yet that could, be, that could be a fulcrum of, what's, of what, what is to come through unwrapping an entire process. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Uh, I, I, I don't really don't care what people do and the Golden Dawn and what they claim. That's up to them. I, I, I don't care these days. Mm -hmm. I haven't got too long to go. Uh, most people in their 70s bow out. I try to keep myself reasonably fit, but anyway, but who knows? Uh, sure. But so, so what I've done is tried to. I realised that in the golden dawn, I'm a brick in the wall, just a brick, and there are other bricks coming in behind me, under me, and above me, and beside me at the same time. And these people are bricks too. It's not the whole wall itself. Where people come in and think they're the whole wall, that's a totally different misconception, I think. But but uh, there's all sorts of grandiose themes coming up. And astral mas uh, masters. I've never met an astral master <laughs> or had them guide me like that. Some people are very good at mediumship. They can talk to the guides who can guide them into doing what they're doing. What I used to one, – one interesting thing happened to me once when I was doing the – for my, my first major – second major book, the North North book, Neophyte book. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson's wife was the one that did the editing of that. She was living next door to uh, a lady in LA yeah. and I met her. She was very good. Anyway, so what happened was that uh, as I was typing the book, I was the information was just flowing through, just coming through like that, able to type it. And my ex came through and she took a photograph and behind me there was a big ball of light about – so big, about like three football, three soccer balls in height. Okay. And it was behind me and she never picked that up. She got it on the camera. I thought it was uh, something wrong in the film. I thought that well, was an overexposure. It was a Pentax. It was a new Pentax. So mm -hmm. I, I doubt that mm -hmm. would happen. Mm -hmm. It never happened in any of the others, but it happened in this <laughs> one. And she said later, she said, she said, that's not... That's not an overexposure. You said that was a photograph or something behind you when you were working. And I, I thought about it. And I've gone back and I said, yes, that's the case. Uh, overexposures do happen, let's face it. But on that particular occasion, I would I, – I, I never agreed for the first. It took me about 15 years for me to agree to it. So, <laughs> so I think, yes, because the way the book came out and the results of afterwards, it was like a channel – I was just yeah. going through doing doing the stuff. So that that was one mm -hmm. of the one of the areas of of, of, of uh, yeah. psychic photography yeah. came through. 
Yeah, but you you are a brick, maybe, but you're certainly a, a major brick, a, a supporting brick. Let's call it like that. <laughs> um, I have one more question about the Golden Dawn and about its content. You just mentioned, of course, that it is very much rooted in the Western civilization, Christianity and, and all its background. Um, if you needed to give us a definition of the balance between the Rosicrucian <laughs> aspect on one side and the Hermetic aspect on the other side within the Golden Dawn. How would you explain that balance to us? Well, the uh, well, the Rosicrucian is is an element, is a byproduct of Hermeticism. Yes, but a very Christian one, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. But you have to understand that that was... It was Christian in content really up until probably the last temple would really say that was a Christian temple was probably Fari Roa. So that closed in 1980. And from that point on, even though the members were still Christian, uh, the, the direction there was was, was, a, was like Christ Christianity and Rosicrucianism to the Golden Dawn was like a scenery. It was like a, a, a like stage managed scenery. It was just an element for the Golden Dawn era to come through and work through. Uh, some people would disagree with me because the five six definitely is is a Christian concept. I don't have any trouble with Christian or non Christian terms because a name is a name of power is a name of power, whichever mm -hmm. way you look at it. Uh, yeah. I knew, I found that out the hard way when I was a kid. But um, I think I think that the um, The Christian side of it is not something that I push. It's not something that I say. I just say something. Well, there's a there's certain elements of that in the Christian the Christian Christianity from the Golden Dawn is still there in 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 its structure, like the the Eucharist, for example, and you see this in the uh, in the equinox ceremonies and its structure and analysis. But it's not it's not the only thing that powers the order. It's not that it, it, uh, the the order is looking for a for a structure. The element or the or the essence of the order wants a structure. The Christian element came through, and that's good for time. But a lot of people don't use it these days. They still use the order, but they don't really have the belief structure in the Christian perspective as it was something yeah. like about twenty twenty thirty years ago. Sure, as things have sure. merged and gone to a different time frame, uh, but they still get they still get energy out of it. So that's a testament to the order working its way through structures. Does does it need Rosicrucians? Of course, was always considered Christian, but the Rosicrucian perception at Fairo was never really pushed. It was always a, it was always dressing, like some like a coat, something you put over something. It's a bit like Regardi putting um, uh, putting magic over uh, over um, uh, over psychology. It was that type of thing. It was never it was never the fundamental belief system of it. Um, yeah. So, so the element of Christianity depends on the individual, but I don't think you'd get too many Christians today looking at the Golden Dawn, uh, cumbersome way of doing things and ritual would appreciate it. But if people come yeah. into it, they'd be looking at magic and probably want exactly. to zap the neighbour. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so the element, the element really today doesn't really stand up, although it's there. It's embedded in it, but it's not embedded in it in an overt way as it used to be. And the difference is that the social structure of the Christian viewpoint of, say, the 19th century has changed. And the last holdout was Furry Row, and that's, that was up till about 19, uh, 1978 that closed. And they had it up to that stage as a, as a Christian order. But after that, mm -hmm. it just... Mm -hmm. uh, from that point on, uh, people just didn't didn't acknowledge it or want to acknowledge it, and that's up to them. I, I, we don't force anyone to do exactly. anything. Uh, exactly. It's exactly. not a it's, it's not a religious order. It, it's an order that takes energy and directs it to a certain concept through a certain construct. Uh, that's how I see it anyway. I could be wrong, but that's just a simple. Yeah, there, there, there again, at least the two of us, we agree again at 120%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, Pat, for letting us take part in that rich well of your knowledge and background. That was really amazing. I have a very, very final question to you. Um, What has magic done to or for you in your life? And if a young person today 
feels attracted by a kind of path like that, where do you think that that person should start and take the first steps? Well, if people want to get into a magical society, regardless of what they want to do, they've got to research and make sure it's structural. They've got to make sure that the structured material re can be used separately to the organisation that they're joining. If the organisation, the people in the organisation are not doing their work, they've got to be able to take material and use it. Um, I see nothing wrong with people. The Kabbalistic method is a good good place to start. It's not the end, but it's just a good place to start. Um, you can research the structure of ritual. Really, if you really want to learn this stuff and really push yourself hard, you'll learn it. Um, if you want to, if you want to look at a whole lot of different aspects that come through, if you start looking at holograms and holographic images, you're looking at psychology, you're looking at a, at, at a myriad of different levels. Mm -hmm. I would say just start start from the start from the Kabbalah uh, as the, as the Golden Dawn did it and as Bota did it simply because it's a way of structure. Now, when you get to a point that you want to get rid of that structure, that's fine as a start point. But you know where you're going, you know where you are, and where you're going. You know what's ahead of you. You know the checks and balances. You know the different aspects of the system. It's already tailor made. Now you can go through an existing system or a similar one in parallel to it, mm. or you're jumping into the main Golden Dawn system as it is, or simply go and do the BOTA order, which uh, which is a little bit too much on geometry for my liking, but still, nevertheless, a good system. That's what I'd suggest you do. And okay. study it. And use, use the tarot cards first. If you haven't got a temple, use the cards. Divine, on a daily basis, divination. Uh, Do the pentagram ritual once a day. Get the rituals basically out and start performing them. Do them in the quiet of your own bedroom. And uh, if you're in the bedroom with someone else and you're sharing sharing a room with someone, just do it in your head. So really, it, it, it's it's up to them to or you uh, as a, a, as a listener to make your own opinions to do that. That, that that's my simply my suggestion. You've got to start somewhere. Start from a structure that works, and then be prepared. To when you get to a certain point, to go over that structure, you can tr you can extrapolate, or you can do away with it, or whatever you want. But start from a structuralized position, so that you get you get a value system as as a start point. Yeah, great. And what has magic done to you? Oh, it's given me a way of life. Really, I didn't really intend to walk into magic. It's just sort of walked into me. Um, I never had much choice, but I think I think it all started as being an altar boy and listening to the Latin mass, and and seeing the power of uh, power of the ritual in a, in a church with full uh, coloured clothing. So putting on a cassock or something was not was not a new uh, not an unnew thing. The only thing I can't do these days is drink the holy uh, drink the. Um, The, uh, the wine as we used to. <laughs> the older boys used to have a sip of wine before we started. But no, that, that was how I first started. But I, yeah. I grew past that cons construct. Structuralism is good. Just do the best you can with it. Mm -hmm. Well, Pat Zaleski, thank you so much for that 70 minutes in your company. It was lovely to have you. And um, well, uh, good luck for all things down there in Australia and for all that your plans that you have. And thanks for being with us here today. Okay, Rudy. Thank you.
the wand number four of that suite of four pieces about the tarot by Sensistry, composed performed by our friend blake erickson thank you very much blake for giving me that music to play to our audience and you all get to check him out and also go on his podcast and listen to the dmt experience podcast Thanks also very much to Pat Zaleski for this lovely interview. It was great to have you on the show. And uh, it's really it's really also great to be back a little bit in that ceremonial magic realm, which I personally enjoy a lot and uh, always learn a lot about those experiences when I hear about them. I hope it was the same for you and you enjoyed that opening of a new season. Well, this brings us to the end of this week's episode. We are going to be back next Sunday, of course, and next Sunday uh, we will have uh, on August 29th a guest, well, from Austria. Yes, after Australia, Australia, it's Austria. For the very first time, I have a compatriot here on this show. Well, this has also to do that, to be honest, the Austrian scene is not highly active and if now there are some Austrians listening to this out there and saying hey, hey that's not true well give me your experiences because um, that is my personal opinion but maybe you have others and you should let me know of course right and next week my co-fellow Austrian is Bernhard Reicher and he is running an excellent video cast actually on YouTube uh, together with a friend about all subsets magic and he does that in German that's maybe most of you haven't yet heard about him um, but you should and if you are people out there who understand German who speak German go on the YouTube website and listen to Bernhard but anyway we'll talk to you more about that next week in English of course because Bernhard has also a very interesting magic school with a very much a storytelling approach we'll tell you all about that next week next Sunday in episode two of the Thoughts Hermes podcast I'm very much looking forward to have you back next week and for today well what can I say take care stay tuned hear you soon